As some of you know, my Voices from Cosa Nostra series here on the channel is the longest running Mafia interview series out of all the current active programs and channels, not just on YouTube, but outside of it as well. Many other outlets primarily are commentary from the host's perspective, where my series has been based on interviews with those who lived to experience and provide our subscribers with firsthand insight straight from these experiences. I try to keep my personal commentary not only secondary but minimal and as i enter my seventh season i am excited to bring back my close friend retired decorated fbi agent jack garcia jack was my second interview in the entire series my first audio interview and our first sit down together was a four-part segment I would suggest for you guys who haven't heard mine and Jack's previous interview to go back in our library, take a listen to that. It kind of gives more of a broad insight into uh, Jack's career overall in the FBI. And if you are interested in the topic of organized crime, please subscribe and hit the notification bell so you will be notified as our new segments drop here on the channel. So many of you know Jack for his infiltration into the Gambino crime family under the alias Jack Falcone. He infiltrated the crew of longtime Gambino captain Greg De Palma. The operation resulted in the arrest and conviction of 32 mobsters. From De Palma all the way up to the Gambino boss, Arnold Squitieri. Today, however, Jack and I will be discussing the Albanian organized crime faction ran by notorious Albanian gangster Alex Rudaj. The Eastern European gangsters are an area that is often in the shadows of the Italians, and I think Jack will be able to shed some light for us from his uh, prior experiences on the street. So that's what we will discuss. I, I know when you and I have sp spoken in the past, Jack, when you first were getting into the operation with Jack Falcone, uh, were you guys targeting the Albanians initially? Well, that's um, that kind of is the genesis of the investigation. Not that we were targeting. What happened was it was a strip club in the Bronx. I was being shaken down by Alex Rudaj and his Albanian gang. Okay. And it's kind of a um, interesting uh, thing where usually strip clubs are marked for this. And it's because, you know, you could cause a ruckus. You could cause violence in there. And the owner is always leery about calling the cops too many times. Because, as you know, that they have... Uh, what they call a nuisance law. So if all of a sudden the cops are responding to your place of business, they're going to shut that business down. A lot of times things are handled with a wink and a nod, maybe an envelope, just to not cause any future problems. So what happened is these Albanians came to this club that was at one time on record with Greg the Palmer's son, Craig. But as you know, Craig was in jail. And at that time, and Craig uh, attempted to, uh, to kill himself in prison. So it was kind of wide open. So the Albanians, as I, and this is before I got in, started coming in on a regular basis. Then they started getting a little more aggressive. They were demanding shakedown and so-called under the guise of protection. Like, hey, you know, you'll be with us. Nothing could happen here. We'll make sure the security is fine etc etc but of course the owners wanted nothing to do with them because they danced that dance before with the mob so they told them we don't need any and they kept coming up the numbers increasing their aggressiveness increased and then finally one night supposedly two albanians walk in followed later by another two by another two now you have the whole place flooded and then that's when chaos erupted uh, supposedly 
people getting smacked around uh, in the bar, bottles broken. There was a gun that went off and scattered everyone. Somebody yelled, the cops are coming. And they kind of said, well, we'll be back. And we want five grand a month from you guys. Otherwise, this will be an ongoing basis. What happened then uh, uh, after that, the next day, mysteriously, a now a captain in the Gambino crime family, Luke Bo Filippelli, walks in wearing his uh, Brioni suit, alligator shoes, and he says uh, to the owners, hey, I heard you had a problem. We can make this problem go away. And the owner said, really? He says, yeah, we know you guys were on record with Craig. Craig is no longer um, with us, you know, being the fact that he was in jail. But we'll make this, go on record with me, we'll make this Albanians go away. So that's when I came in. It was decided that they wanted an experienced agent uh, to come in and become a part owner, so to speak, of the strip club. Mm -hmm. So it was arranged for Filippelli and his boys to come. And, of course, we recorded. uh, I think it was both. I know it was audio, but maybe uh, on film as well, uh, paying off to them where we gave them the money with assurances that the Albanian problem would be no more. And sure enough, after that payment, we never saw the Albanians uh, again. Now, that, and later on as time went on, we came to realize, Michael, that this is your textbook extortion. You know, Mm -hmm. you create a situation and you offer a solution still paying it's still paying so my opinion as well as the other agents and everyone they were working in concert right the albanians were right. kind of like the westies of the gambinos they were there but they also had their little side deal by all means they were very vicious they were very greedy and were really hard to control so that's how the Albanian. We had t- we started working. Um, we originally thought it was going to be the Albanians, and then we started working targeting Louis Filippelli and his group. Well, of course, because the, I mean that that could lead all the way up to, and in the end, you could taken down Arnold Squitieri, who was the sitting boss of the family. So. When you implanted, how how were you introduced? Were you introduced as a potential buyer into the strip club? No, I was introduced as an actual, you know, uh, investor in the uh, in the strip club. But one thing I should also note, Michael, is that when we, when the owners and we started dealing with Filippelli, there was no record of him whatsoever in the FBI. Oh, interesting. He was, he was a ghost. We had no idea who he was. We l- Later, as we put our surveillance on him, we saw that he's hitting the right places. He's meeting with the right people. Uh, and then we, of course, do our research and find out that uh, he uh, is the nephew of Arnold Scuteri. But at that time, we did not know the leadership. I mean, you have to understand that uh, at that time, it was either John Gotti Jr., it was the Triumvirate, it was Peter Gotti. So it was kind of uh, the world that we, we really did not know who what was the administration. Right. So we didn't know who uh, uh, Filippelli was, but we started to get to know Filippelli. But then, interesting enough, like soon after that, that same day that he got out of jail, he goes and shows up at the club and he starts saying, hey, this was on record with my son. This is my club. Well, you're, talking so about now, Gre- you're talking about Greg Sr. Greg, Greg Sr., correct. Because right. at that time, keep in mind, Craig De Palma, this, they were arrested. Craig De Palma and Craig, along with John Gotti Jr. and Mikey Scars, all of these guys have been arrested for what happened with the Gold's Gym down in Atlanta as well as his course. Right. So when they Greg gets out, um, 
we really didn't want anything to do with Greg. And the reason for that is we thought that Greg was a marked man. In fact, the FBI went to see Greg and told him, I said, look, while you were in jail, you took a contract out on a guy you had sponsored to be straightened out. That was Nikki LaSorsa. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, you have a target on your back. You, you know, so I would, and of course, Rick De Palma in his classic way says, what are you talking about? I never even heard of Nikki LaSorsa. <laughs> I don't know anything. And if you say I know, I don't know nothing. I didn't hear anything. If you say I was there, I must have been asleep. You know, <laughs> right. you know textbook, textbook mob the line, you know? Right. So we were kind of like, no, but then we thought about it long and hard, and we figured, what better person? We like to take people, because when you take somebody, it, it, it's absolutely indefensible. You know, it's their words telling you what they did or are doing. And, of course, Greg Palmer, he loved to talk. So it was like a perfect marriage. So we hitched our wagon. We met with Filippelli and told Filippelli to say, like, kind of, Look, um, we're with Greg at this place. He says, I understand, but you decide. You want to hit your wagon to Greg, even though Greg got his stripes back, which means he still was captain, or you could come with us. We chose to go with Greg because Greg, I feel, will get us more. However, from an undercover perspective, meaning me out there in the street, I had to start worrying about Nikki Lasorsky. Because, hey, no matter how you d- disguise it or describe it, Nikki LaSorsa had a hit on him from Greg De Palma. So there was bad blood there. Right. So anyway, we, we did stick with Greg. Uh, we then, of course, Greg within, uh, uh, you know, p- p- bought the whole line that I was an investor in the club. I was a guy from Miami. I was a third generation Sicilian. Uh, and I had money. I had uh, always money, which is what uh, Greg and all the monsters. Yep, loved. that that that's your yeah. that's your key right into the house right there. Yep, it, exactly. That's all you have to do. It's less than, that. of course, with Greg, he started. You know, he got back into the world uh, of mob. He was in prison for a while. He started talking about certain things that were happening out there, including the Albanians, but also. The other interesting thing, we found out what the administration was. We knew that Arnold Scuteri was the acting boss, right. but he called him the boss. Because I said, I was playing dumb. I said, well, what do you mean acting boss? Is he temporary? He goes, no, a boss is the boss, period. Then McGalley was the uh, underboss, okay. and then the third was Jojo. So uh, that was, uh, he was the concierge. So... Okay we were able for the first time to come up with the administration uh, of the Gambino crime. Right, draw the chart. Right, we had the chart, it was available still, there was no mention of uh, of Filippelli because, you know, uh, Albanians started getting more involved. As Greg early on was visiting with the Albanians, he says, I got to see them. He was angry at the Albanians. Now, I wasn't including in that. <clears throat> at that time, they started bringing Robert Vaccaro, also not in the charts, also unknown to have been a, a made guy in the uh, Gambino crime family. Mm-hmm. Uh, he started being in the crew with Greg and later was promoted to acting skipper in our crew. So what happened is they were visiting the Albanians and they were supposed to have been a very big beef that, as Greg described, it was a pebble in his shoe, as he called it. The fact that some Albanian guys yanked out, I think it was Joe Gambino, from a club out in um, Astoria and totally removed his clothing, took his wallet, and the Gambino crime family did nothing about it. That that, that 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 really to me is awesome. unbelievable. <laughs> yes, as well as with me. But this was something that bothered Greg, and then because we knew that the Albanians and the Gambinos were somehow in cahoots, maybe they started flexing their wings and they said, "Hey, you know, 
and the hell with you guys. You guys are calling us for violence. Why, why that? So I know Greg had several meetings. Um, I think there's a cafe. If I hear the name of it in Morris Park in the Bronx, which kind of was Alex's uh, uh, base of operation at the time. But anyway, Greg would go there uh, and do that. Now, we really didn't get too much involved with the Albanians. However, there were certain times that he would throw out the name. He'd go, look, if there's a problem with that. We'll send the Albanians. So that, to me, corroborated that, yes, they're working with them hand in hand. And then, of course, the uh, the story of how Arnold Scutieri and uh, a bunch of, uh, of his soldiers in the Gambino crime family went fully strapped to out in Jersey uh, and met with uh, a few with Alex and company mm-hmm. at this gas station. And the threat was made where supposedly, according to Greg, Arnold Scutieri said, you took what you took, but you're not taking no more. And Alex had guys positioned with shotguns to aim it at the pumps so they could blow it up. But I guess cooler heads prevailed. They saw that they were outnumbered and that maybe the Gambino crime family was a bit serious in this. And that was the end of supposedly uh, the Albanians encroaching on their territory. So um, that was the, the part that I didn't hear much of them until the very end. Just so you know, when we were out for dinner once with Greg and the news broke, that uh, the Albanians had been arrested and Alex Rudas was arrested. And Greg De Palma said, he said uh, something to the effect of, well, good, they should be consider themselves very lucky. And that's when I said, well, what are you talking about? Why? He says, because they were marked for death by the Lukes. Uh, the Lucases were, were supposedly going to take them out yeah weren't they shaking down uh like a lucchese joint or a couple lucchese bars or something yes all of the places were uh, on record with the lucchese's in astoria okay uh queens and these were greek after hour and gambling clubs and generated a lot of money and that's where i forgot the name of them a sport something uh, something with soccer or whatever but they were shaking it down, and they were kind of invading the territory of the Lucases. And I think the Lucases had enough, and according to Greg, they should have considered themselves lucky that uh, they got arrested, because otherwise... Now, I know the FBI worked a fantastic case. The agent, I know, well, he was uh, very aggressive, and of course, uh, took them out to... uh, took them all out at the time we were out there. But soon at the after the beginning and after we paid off the uh, the mob, we never heard from them or saw them. Mm-hmm. I didn't, at least. But Greg De Palma did on occasion go to this cafe in Morris Park to talk to Alex Rudas, and that he did not share with me. So, so essentially, after that meeting with Arnold Squitieri the Rudage crew backed off from the Gambinos, but then started shaking down Lucchese joints. That, that's the way I see it. You know, right, I right. see it that they started, you know, shaking down. You know, listen, the Albanian uh, group, I, you know, there's, there's all you read about them wanting to become the sixth family. I, I don't know anything about that. All I can tell you is that they were, uh, they were a gang of really tough, ruthless, uh, individuals that right. really had no fear and you know and I get why they felt so strong is and like I said earlier if someone hires you to be the muscle you know that tells me you're weak because you got to hire me right <clears throat> and because you know these guys were that ruthless they said hey guess what we don't need them what are we going to work chump change we'll just take it Right. And they made right. no quarrel about it. They operated in all these gray areas because that's how the mob works. And, you know, it's tough to shake down Walmart. It's safe to shake down Target. 
But hey, when you deal with something that's in the gray area, or something operating illegally, an after hours, a gambling parlor, a strip joint, you know, uh, you, you run into, uh, what are your choices? You go to the police, you got problems. Um, and if you are working a legitimate bar and you keep calling the police, you're going to have problems with that too. After a while, they're going to say, you know what? It's not working. We're here every other week. Why keep this place open? And that's how they do, they, they work their um, magic, I guess, for lack of a better word. But they were a group to be uh, reckoned with. I don't, I know that there was an Italian guy who was a Gambino associate, Kalati, I think was his name. And he was uh, an associate of a guy named Lascalzo, who was also a mate guy, I think, with the Gambinos. So that could be the conduit as to why they had been working with the Gambinos. Oh. Uh, because Lenny Kalati was part of that, yet there was he was not an Albanian. And people sometimes describe them as the shepherd of of the group. I don't think so. I think he just uh, uh, had a bond and friendship, uh, a long-time association with the Albanians, and then he just uh, uh, realized that, and as you know, it's all about making money. So right. if he's making money with the Albanians, or then he hitched that wagon to it. And my understanding, he was not straightened out that once Lascalzo died, that uh, I guess he didn't get straightened out. So that would even give him more of, of a reason to be aligned with the Albanians than the Gambinos. Right, yeah, absolutely. That would m definitely make sense. And, <clears throat> and, and as you pointed out, I mean, the one thing with uh, the Albanians, you know, they generally stick amongst themselves as far as their, you know, their core group. You know, they're a group that kind of stick amongst themselves, you know. Um, Very true. Well, it's kind of similar to the Italian mob. I mean, it's all depending on territory. You know, right, if right. your neighborhood is Italian and you are Hispanic or you're Albanian, you become friends with Italians. Right. But if you right. are in an immersed area among all Cubans or among all uh, Italian, that's who you, you kind of belong to. So, I mean, you mentioned other Albanians involved. Look at Sef Mustafa. I mean, Seth Mustafa is a bad dude, and uh, he was involved in that uh, telemarketing uh, scam that, uh, not only telemarketing, but an internet scam that was the largest ever perpetrated on the American public. I mean, this was to the tune of almost a billion dollars. Seth Mustafa was hooked up with Tori Lacasio, Richie Martino, Andrew Campos, and they, uh, along with some others, perpetrated this where they created phone books cramming where they would take your phone bills and take 20 cents of your bill. Wow. Uh, or they would move to uh, the next phase would be uh, creating internet where kids will go on and see naked women and then they'll say, look, stop, show me your ID. You have to have a credit card or something. We're not going to bill you. And sure enough, they built you. And the, uh, we took them down. Actually, when I was out there on the cover, I met with Andrew Campos. I sold him a television set, a stolen television set, but we never charged him because he then started being wrapped up in this uh, internet fraud that I think they wound up pleading guilty, but they pled guilty, I think, to $750 million dollars. Oh my and gosh. what makes yeah. it so interesting about that case, which I think was better than the Lufthansa case, I mean, those agents did a fantastic job, uh, is that they got some minor um, uh, jail term. Andrew Campos is out. That guy is sitting on millions and millions of dollars. I remember Greg the Palmer telling me, because uh, Greg, uh, we had lunch with uh, Andrew. He was saying, you have no idea how much money these guys made nationally and internationally. I said, the government is charging them for like $700 million. They made in the billions, he said. And that's wow. why John Gotti, John Gotti did not allow them to go to wakes, to weddings. Everything was low profile because these guys were cash cows. And Sef Mustafa was known to be right in that. So there is an Albanian who has friends 
also with that, and, you know, it all probably depends. He might have grown up in Howard Beach or something, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Success in that life is always hinges on monetary, you know, what, what, what you're worth, what you bring in. So, I mean, that guy definitely would have been far more successful than an Alex Rudage, you know? That's, uh, oh, I, yeah, I mean, yeah, his well, value, right. value-wise, you know? Yeah, well, everything is, even, look, even in the, uh, uh, the way life operates in, in that world, it's all about image. You know, right. uh, I could remember early on when Robert Vaccaro just had like, gotten out of jail, he had just straightened out, and Greg would tell me, I said, this guy can't rub two nickels together, he's a the farm. <laughs> he goes, I gotta give him some money, he was saying to me, you know? And he liked Robert, but he questioned Robert because he knew Robert came with the Philip Pelly and the Arnold uh, regime, and he didn't. He might have felt that maybe this guy was put here with me, so he could probably take over. Maybe that Nikki Lasorsa thing is still out there brewing, but so he kind of he liked Robert, but he kept him a little bit at arm's length. And one of the things about Robert, you would go out and you would see him, uh, you know, he had a water of cash. It's all about all these monsters. That the bigger your knot is with that broccoli band around, it, the more successful you are. The bigger your pinky ring, the suit that you get. You can't go to one of these men's warehouse. I mean, you walk in with an Italian uh, Zania suit or Brioni your alligator shoes, your car, the car you drive, it's all about imagery because it exudes that, hey, I'm not a broken down police. I'm not a Montefam. I'm doing good. I, you know, I bring you uh, money and wealth, so cut me in on your deal. Right. It's all It's all a, a, an imagery. You don't see some guy who can rub. Look at this thing with uh, uh, Lefty. The guy... In the movie, Tony Brasco, the guy's right. breaking coins. Uh, <laughs> right, a, uh, parking meters. I mean, I can, can it be anybody who's so more broke than that? But also keep in mind, too, that in the mob circles now, they have learned. They've morphed. They, I think now they're going back to what they're supposed to be, which is a secret criminal society. So right. that flash, they, those celebrity gangsters like John Gotti, Joey Merlino, all of those guys, you're putting a target on your back. Nowadays, they don't even... Look, i give you an example with Greg De Palma. Arnold Scuteri was very sharp, very old-school guy. Mm -hmm. And every time Greg would meet him, he would say to me, you have no idea what I went through. And I go, what happened? He goes, 5 o'clock in the morning, he picked me up. Then we go to a place in the city, a garage. We park my car, another car is waiting in the garage. We go out the other way. Then we drive to another garage, do the same thing. Then we're crossing the tunnel, the uh, Holland Tunnel. Then we're crossing back into the Lincoln Tunnel and then go to the GW and we meet in some park with Arnold. <laughs> so Arnold was very, very cautious. He was not your, hey, come on Tuesday and kiss ring at the Ravenite. You right, know? right. Like, God, he was a guy who... Uh, and especially, he probably said with Greg, he probably went even a little extra just for that. But that's kind of what the mob is doing now. They're not putting these targets. They realize that well, they, the flashy Mercedes and right. the rings and the social clubs, there's no social clubs anymore. Right. That's what I was about to say. That that would be a very stupid thing to have in this, especially this day and age where there is street surveillance everywhere. You know what I mean? I mean, not just oh, not yes. just FBI surveillance, but actual, you know, like uh, NYPD, just street surveillance, you know, whether it's the, the DOT, exactly. right, DOT or wh whoever, you know, they have cameras everywhere. Yeah, no, no. And that's one of the reasons that there you don't see uh, those who were informants wind up in the streets like the old day, because committing a murder now, uh, there could be a camera everywhere and owned by whomever. So right. it, it all becomes... They, they don't they want to get away with that because they learn that leaving bodies on the street is bad for business so they're no longer in that the social clubs have been shut down now they're longer trying to be quiet 
They're not out there pumping their chest. Everything is, is, is done that. And, and look, has it worked? I don't know. I think it has because I know the FBI's investigative priorities. We used to have five squads in New York for each family. And right. now we're down to what, two? Do, do we think that organized... I don't think organized crime is done and over with. I think organized is going back to its roots and they're operating in the shadows right. as they were meant to operate from the beginning. Maybe they're, uh, you know, operating in a more lightened manner, like, you know, smaller numbers. That is definitely it. And also, I remember when I was out there, Greg the Palmer told me, he said, the Bonanno guys, he would say, do you believe these Bonanno guys? They're getting guys straightened out and they strip them. He would say, why would you even straighten out a guy that you got to strip? Right. What is that That's a good say? point. That's a good point. Right. What does that say about uh, organized crime? What does that say about Cosa Nostra? The fact that you got to strip a guy to just to see if uh, he's wearing a wire? Are you kidding me? Yeah, but the irony is, as he's saying that, you're recording him on a wire, you know? Oh, that is the irony of it. But, you know, but that's kind of the mentality. A lot of guys also rather stay you know, like in the background and say, you know what, they, they like the protection, they like operating under the flag mm -hmm. where they can do unions, they can do construction, but maybe they don't want to take that step because number one is, uh, you know, you put yourself on, on that board. Uh, now you're, you're a mate guy, you're part, you could be trapped up in a RICO. Right. That's the interesting thing. RICO has totally put these guys on the run. They're more afraid of the government than they are of themselves. And that's a scary thing. I mean, you look at Philadelphia. I mean, these guys got banged for 30 years, 20 years, 25. That's a long time for you to do in prison for something. Look at Gene Gotti. I mean, you really have to believe in Cosa Nostra. You know, and I, and nowadays, some of these guys are like businessmen. They make business-like decisions. Hey, you know what? I went bankrupt. I'll cooperate. You know, Going to jail and doing a lot of time, uh, you know, not for anything, but it does say a lot about the character of the of my adversaries, these mobsters, because that's a long time for somebody to do. Bro, oh, absolutely. Know? And some of those guys are steeped in that tradition. However, you know, when you listen to some of these or, you know, read some of these comments that individuals make on, you know, various platforms, including mine, you know, where people are like, you know, rat this or rat that. Well, you forget what who you're talking about there's no honor amongst thieves you know these yeah. guys are always looking for a deal to cut and if that deal happens to be the government to get to save their neck why wouldn't they do that you know they're not loyal mostly to anybody but themselves you know exactly it's all about that and and it's a shame too because look you hit the nail on the head there is no honor with these thieves because i'll tell you what they greg this is typical greg greg would talk about it, he says, that's why they have sit-downs. Let's say, for instance, you rob a tractor trailer mm -hmm. and it's got fur coats. So let's say it's valued at half a million. Okay, I steal your truck, I find out that that truck is with the Lucchese. Okay, now we're the Gambinos. We stole the truck. Now we want to say, hey, get that truck back. So what do you say? You're not going to give them the back for $500,000. You said, oh man, I sold it for 100 G's. Now, he probably sold it for two fifty. So now he's already lying about one fifty. Mm -hmm. Then they said, "All right, we'll get the truck back, sold it for a hundred, but hey, I'm going to keep fifty. You get fifty. <laughs> so the right thing to do in the world would be is, hey, we stole your truck. Here's your truck back. That's the mob, but they don't because they don't trust a anyone. It's all about making that money with them, and that's their Achilles heel." Their Achilles heel is the greed. And right. as long as they are greedy, it's uh, how they get caught. They constantly, uh, uh, that greed gets them no matter what. And not just necessarily the mob. I'm talking about every criminal organization. Exactly. It's all about money. Right, the, yeah. 100%. Whether it's the mafia, the cartels, uh, the, the Albanians, the Serbians, it doesn't matter. It's like you're an organized crime organization. It all hinges on one thing, and that is 
you know, making money, whether you're pushing narcotics, you're moving guns, you're, you know, you're, you're running numbers, gambling, prostitution rackets, whatever. It's all about money at the end of the day, yeah. you know? Very true. Yeah, very, very true. interesting. Well, Jack, I really appreciate it. I, I, you know, I knew that, you know, in our previous talks that, um, that you touched on the Albanians a little bit, and I thought that you'd be able to shed a little bit of insight with what that crew was doing. It's an honor coming on your show, Michael. I've known you for many years on a personal yeah. level, and almost you are a decade. one of the original pioneers in, um, uh, in the world of podcast, and, uh, uh, which I know now it's totally saturated with everyone. Uh, no. I always given you kudos for your insight and your knowledge in Cosa Nostra, and uh, I'm proudly glad to call you my friend. Man, I really appreciate that, Jack. I really do. Uh, absolutely. Likewise. I mean, I I think your insight is, you know, has so much value, not just from the street perspective, because essentially you kind of have it both ways. You're, you know, a decorated federal agent you know retired federal agent now uh but also you pretty much were a mafioso <laughs> for several years you know so it's it's a it's a very interesting perspective that you have that really only a few people really have technically so yeah. um, well thank you brother and uh i wish you a lot of luck and success and i'll take uh, care, right? absolutely i'll talk to you soon right. mm -hmm. bye-bye